right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Mike Maynard, who is in Chichester in the UK. How are you doing, Mike? Hi, John. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And Mike is the managing director of Napier, self confessed geek who lives talking about technology. And the good thing is, today we're going to talk about how account based marketing can help. Uh, sales close bigger deals. Um, Mike, let's start off because these kind of terms come along every so often. Uh, you know, inbound marketing, you know, now account based marketing, and sometimes I think people don't under, don't really have a good definition of what it is, and even people who start talking about it don't have a good definition of what it is. So, what is account based marketing? That's a great question, John, to start with. So I think um, ultimately account-based marketing is just good marketing that's focused on the, on the clients or the potential clients that are likely to spend the most money with you. That, that's all it's trying to do is identify by company who's likely to spend the money and then focus on those guys. Yeah, and and that and and at this time of year, you know, there's probably a lot of people who are on fiscal calendar years and probably starting looking at next year and planning quotas and all of that. So this is the time to really start to identify your your accounts or whatever with the greatest opportunity for for expansion. Right? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, account based marketing has always existed in some form. Mm. You know, salespeople have always called on the biggest customers um, and focus their time on that. I think what's what's really changed is that technologies made it easier to target, particularly the marketing activities um, to individual accounts and even to some extent to individual people. So, you know, to me, what you should be thinking about is, um, you know, how easy is it to win this? new customer who's never going to spend very much rather than you know getting this potentially huge customer or potentially getting one of our existing uh, customers to spend more yeah yeah because i mean obviously sometimes it's very very uh, it's very tempting if you like to to focus on the ones that we're most familiar with or the ones that we you know think are going to be the path of least resistance um you know whereas as you say you can invest a ton of time with a smaller account and not earn that much money, the same amount of time and effort put into a larger account, yes, it may take a little more, a little bit more strategy, it may take a little more work, but the payoff is so much greater. Absolutely, and, and quite often we find that um, if you do the right things and focus in on that particular large account, it doesn't take much more time, and it certainly doesn't take more time than talking to a large number of smaller accounts. So what are some of the things that uh, salespeople and, and marketing people should do for, you know, to focus in on large accounts? What are some of the things they should do to prepare themselves and give themselves the best opportunity of getting into those accounts or expanding those accounts? So I think there's, there's basically, um, you know, three things they need to do. First is define the kind of accounts that are their ideal accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's working out who does spend the most money or who's more profitable. Um, and that, that fundamentally comes down to where there's a good fit. Um, the second thing you really need to do is understand who's involved in the decision. And that depends on what you're selling, clearly. Um, you know, with some products uh, you're selling into accounts, you might only have, you know, a couple of people involved in the decision. Whereas if you've got, um, you know, a major technical pro product going to an engineering company, which is what we work in, um, there could be tens of people, maybe hundreds of people involved in that decision, influencing it. So you work out who's going to make the decision. And then finally, the third step is to work out how to reach those people who are going to make the decision. And, th and that often is, is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. And, and just going back to your first point there about who's involved. And obviously, I mean, nowadays, there can be a lot of people involved and it depends on this, the, the type of deal, etc. And, and I think that's one of the starting points. And I don't think that's something that often people do very well is that, you know, mapping out who's influencing the sale. I mean, it's one of the reasons why on, on our on our CRM product, you know, we have a buying center where you can actually map out who's influencing the sale because sometimes let's face it uh, mike right you can have 
internal people who are influencing it maybe in in a positive way they have needs etc you can have naysayers who are influencing it in a negative way you can have external people such as maybe consultants or whatever who are also influencing and if you can't map out that whole picture and really understand it you're always going to come up kind of bump up against obstacles yeah absolutely and i think you know the ability to model that decision making unit is is really core whether you're in marketing or sales and i mean i've worked on both sides in, in yeah. sales and in marketing and really understanding that that decision making unit and being able to to store it in something like um the crm um is absolutely essential because that's the only way you're going to be able to work together as a team with the marketing um and, and sales uh, resources that you have in your company yeah and then as you said i mean finding out what the decision making process is going to be what the time frame is going to be all of that stuff and i think sometimes uh, maybe we're a little reluctant to really push and ask hard you know what the decision making process is going to be and who's going to be involved and all of that and and sometimes we just take the first superficial answers instead of digging a little deeper yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember um, one time when I was working in sales, and you know, everyone was was at a sales meeting. We we're presenting, um, and and it was it was an American sales meeting, very very much endless spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And then this Italian guy who'd just been hired got up, and he just put up organization charts, and he was talking about well, this guy, his child goes to school with this guy's child, and and these two mm -hmm. wives are friends, and and I mean his knowledge of the account was phenomenal and he could tell you well if we need to get to this guy we need to talk to this guy first because you know this guy's a senior manager but not technical and he's friends with this engineer and so you've got to get the engineer convinced because he'll go and ask him and, and I think you know really understanding not just how things should work but how things work in reality is 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 really the key to making this work yeah i know absolutely and i and i think that's a, that's a fascinating example because that that really does um, illuminate um the need to be able to map out these things and to be able to figure out these relationships because as you say i mean the thing about it is when you're in a in a buying situation you know it can be somebody much lower down the or the org chart who actually has the most influence over it and if you're not doing your homework you would never really naturally come along come across that Great point. I mean, I think quite often, particularly salespeople, they tend to look to purchasing as being incredibly influential mm -hmm. and, and purchasing are very involved, but they don't necessarily make the decision, particularly if you've got a product that's unique. Um, mm -hmm. and, and quite often, um, products that are important to you as a, a salesperson um, may not be something that really matters to the, the senior management. So it can be people lower down um, in the structure that make those decisions. And if you don't understand that, you're talking to the wrong people. It doesn't matter how good your relationships are with senior managers. If you don't talk to the person who makes the decision, it's not going to work. Yeah, no, no, ab absolutely. And, and that's the perfect uh, example there is where you can get sidetracked if you're ending up, if you're trying to be too hierarchical in your approach. Or I think the other mistake that a lot of people fall into is when you get one sympathetic ear is you just focus on that. And as we say, as we said, I mean, if there's different people influencing in different ways and the way people influence a, 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 a purchase, you know, can can vary wildly. Absolutely. You know, I think I think that's also the other thing is you talk to someone who's who's, as you say, that sympathetic ear, who's enthusiastic, it's easy, but actually they may not be the person who has any authority. They may just be genuinely interested and that's not going to help you sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the person who thinks they should do something, but they have absolutely no, you know, no influence over over making it happen. Um, and then what are some other what are some other things that sales and marketing should should uh, keep in mind, especially going into 2021 about account based marketing and the best way to approach it and implement it if you're not doing it today? Sure, great question. So um, I think today we've got an opportunity to do account based marketing. And it's easier than it's ever been. I mean, people have been doing this forever. You know, people have been sending gifts to their, their mm -hmm. key targets. It's, it's not a big change from that. But now you can do it at scale. Now companies can go from, you know, really manually doing account based campaigns that might address, say, 10 key customers or 10 key targets. They can do this on hundreds or thousands of companies. Um, and so to me, it's about understanding how you're going to reach those people. You know, for a lot of um, our clients, LinkedIn 
is uh, the first stop because of its mm -hmm. ability to reach people with certain um, job roles or job titles um, within particular industries. And, and that often is a great first step. Um, but ultimately, I think what you need to be doing is looking to ways to own those contacts. I mean, uh, it, it all comes down to basically building the data that fills your CRM. Yeah, yeah, and, and absolutely. And I think there's a, there's a great example, too, is if you're going to do this, um, regard, whether you use LinkedIn or something else, the key thing is the preparation work, right? Like, is the really like micro targeting, like really understanding the characteristics of your ideal customer, really understanding the, the, the right scenarios or circumstances where it matters. But I mean, I think that that prep work is incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we had a, we had an example recently, we were working with a, a client and we've been focusing on software engineers because they were selling tools mm -hmm. for software, um, uh, for software development. And, and it, it was logical, it made sense. And then we started talking about some of the more senior influencers who really mattered for these guys. And we found actually that a lot of them didn't have software job titles. So some right. of them were like head of IOT. And um, it, it's really interesting if you don't do that prep work and really hammer down and make sure you understand what job titles you're targeting and why you're targeting them and why they want to talk to you. Um, you'll just be wasting your time and you can end up thrashing around, you know, doing a lot of work and not achieving very much. Whereas a really good plan makes a huge difference. And that's, that's more so true today than ever before, because when you were, you know, posting stuff to 10 accounts, um, you know, that was fairly easy. You could easily see a problem. But when you scale up a campaign to 2,000 accounts on LinkedIn, then that is where you just lose sight of things. And if you haven't planned, it's going to go wrong. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And then you're going to end up, you know, rather than being targeted, you're just going to end up as like, you know, scattergun tactics and hoping that you hit a target. Uh, but I think the one thing you touched on there, I think that's, I just want to underline that's incredibly important is that what you just said about the job titles, uh, I think nowadays uh, what we've seen and we're going to see more of is we're, we're seeing new jobs emerging. We're seeing new titles emerging and all of that. And if you're not on top of that, um, then as you say, you can be completely targeting the, the, the wrong people. So you have to kind of... Uh, you have to kind of put aside any any assumptions, you know, past is not prologue. You have to really look to the future and sort of say, OK, how is this company that I'm targeting or how is this industry? How is it evolving and what type of people and roles and, and even, the as, I, as you said, the job titles, because they can be very different nowadays because there's a lot of specialization coming in. Absolutely. I think you've got to you've really got to learn from your big uh, customers to be able to know what to do to target the, the prospects. So it, it is about learning um, and keeping up to speed. And you know, the honest truth is that ABM's amazingly powerful when it works well. Mm -hmm. But if you're targeting you know, your key account and you're targeting people who have no influence on the purchasing decision, it's an absolute waste of time. You've got to get it right. Um, and, it, and it can be quite painful if you do get those uh, targets wrong. So. Um, totally agree, you know, keep up to speed on what people are being called in the industry um, or in your customer's industry and, and how those job titles are changing. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And then what, what's one last piece of advice you would give to people, uh, you know, going into 2021, uh, you know, particularly as it's still, a, it's still a year of unknowns. We're coming out of, a, of obviously a very crazy year. Mm. 2021 is still a year of unknowns. What's some advice that you would give to sales and marketing folk? Yeah, I mean, I wish I knew what was going to happen in 2021, sure. but I, I think it's it's always a challenge. Um, I mean, to me, in terms of sales and marketing, I, my piece of advice would be to work together. If I've, you know, looked from my business point of view, there's been one really positive thing that's come out of 2020 with all the bad things that have happened, um, is it's forced sales and marketing to work closer together. Um, and that's, you know, partly because um, sales can't go out and visit customers and they're in, you know, sat at home and they, they need leads, they need to work with marketing. Um, and partly because I think, you know, there's been so much pressure, marketing has to show value. Um, mm -hmm. And to me, that's been a huge benefit of 2021. I've seen it across a range of clients where, you know, the interaction between sales and marketing has leveled up 
to you know a much higher level much greater quality and if people can keep that going in 2021 as the salespeople then can get back out to visiting customers and getting all that great intelligence they get when they're actually on a customer site that that is pretty much the you know the route forward for success yeah, no, I think that's a that's an absolutely great great point. Uh, I always I always kind of laugh a little when I have these uh, conversations about sales and marketing alignment because I always go like, what year is it? Oh, it's twenty twenty. <laughs> we're still we're still we're still talking about sales and marketing alignment. Um, and I think it is it, the companies who get it right really benefit hugely from it. And I think you're you're absolutely correct. This is a perfect time, a perfect opportunity. Uh, now that they in many ways have been forced to work together is to make that the default position going forward and, and, and really build upon build upon those connections. Uh, listen, Mike, this has been fantastic. Um, all of Mike's information is going to be in the in his bio below this video. But before we go, please, Mike, do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I run Napier. We're a, a PR and marketing agency. Um, we work with um, high tech uh, B2B customers. So anything from small startups up to, to enterprises. And really, I'm, I'm keen to talk to anyone. So uh, I'm very happy to answer questions if people have those. Um, and they're welcome to contact me um, either through LinkedIn, which should be pretty easy to find me search for Mike Maynard and Napier. Um, or alternatively, Mike at NapierB2B.com is my email address. Um, and if you're, you're into marketing, you're a marketing geek, you can also uh, uh, check out our podcast. We've got a, a podcast called Marketing B2B Technology. Um, and we're, we're working to be as professional as you, John, but I think we've, we've got a, a few hundred episodes to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Very kind. Um, listen again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining this morning. I really would uh, encourage people to check out Napier, check out Mike's uh, podcast and vlog. I think that absolutely sales and marketing working together next year. If you're not already, make 2021 the year of sales and marketing alignment finally you, you got so many obstacles so many other things to worry about having those internal div divisions makes no sense whatsoever all right my name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeliner crm i will see you all for another expert interview really soon thank you <laughs>